Pastor Sam Adiyami founded a hugely successful ministry in the heart of one of the world's largest cities and countries, Lagos, Nigeria. But it hasn't been easy. 50% of the country is majority Muslim. Significant tension exists between Christian and Muslim communities in the north. 70% of the country lives below the poverty line. It is from this setting that Sam founded 25,000 member Daystar Christian Center. In 1994, discouraged by the struggles of his tiny ministry, he sought God for a new vision. He and his wife took up a time of fasting and praying, and several months later, a new calling was born. He felt God impress upon him a vision to teach biblical principles for discovering and releasing human potential. Because of the context, the cornerstone of his ministry has since become giving hope, helping people believe that God can change their outcomes. Sam's leadership is marked by a passion for breaking down hierarchical systems, leading counterculturally, and empowering young leaders. Let's welcome Pastor Sam Adiyami to the summit. I was born into a middle-class family. My dad was a government employee. We fared better than most in the rural town where I grew up the first 10 years of my life. Then my dad went into business as a building contractor. By the way, my grandfather was also a builder. So building is in the family. So my father made me a director in his company while I was in high school. And this influenced my studying engineering in college. However, things went bad for the business, and our family went through a period of financial hardship. As a result of the deprivation that we experienced at that time, I was desperate to find a way you know, to succeed, a way to be sure about my future. You know, the deprivation created insecurity, created fears about the future. And I began to read as much as I could on how to succeed. Well, my definition of success was to be comfortable, to have some money, have a good house, have some cars, you know, have a nice family. That was my definition of success. And along the line, I realized that God didn't want me to be a building contractor. He wanted me to teach and to pastor. Now, when I got over into pastoring, I carried my desire to succeed over into ministry and everything that I did. I just wanted to succeed. I wanted to be a successful pastor with a large church and with all the things that go with it. <laughs> Beautiful house, nice family, uh, nice cars, and some money to spend. Unfortunately for me, our church grew so slowly. <laughs> the first few years, I was frustrated. <laughs> I should show you how frustrated I was. The ushers would count the number of people who attended the service and give me the figure every Sunday at the end of the service. And for months, it would be the same figure. Or an addition of one person, or a subtraction of one person. So somewhere along the line, I told them, you know what, don't give me those figures anymore. <laughs> I, I don't want to go home depressed every Sunday. Now, I should give you a background to all that. Uh, in the environment in which I grew up and where my wife and I have pastored, when you don't have money, it's pretty hard. No social security. No home loans, no car loans. To do anything, you just have to have the cash. So things were pretty, pretty hard. And one day, I prayed to the Lord. I said, the Bible says, and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. 
why aren't you bringing people? <laughs> because that, that verse of the Bible helped me to place where the responsibility was. The Lord added to the church. So now I'm wondering why you aren't bringing people. So I had the Lord say in my heart, I, I mean, he responded with the question, why do you want the church to grow? When God asks you a question, you need to remember it's not because he doesn't know the answer. <laughs> Most of the time, he wants to confront you with your foolishness, and I sensed something like that was coming. So I didn't say anything. <laughs> so the Lord said to me, I know why you want the church to grow. You want to be more comfortable. That's why you want the church to grow. He said, but that's not why I set up this church. He said to me, you will not find the definition of success until you help these people that I sent to you to succeed. You will not find the definition of success until you help these people to succeed. Now listen to me, whether you pastor a church or you lead a business, this is a powerful paradigm shifting statement. For me, it was life changing. It was a turning point. It was an aha moment. See, what I realized was that for most leaders, the object of leadership is their own success. The object of leadership for most leaders is their own success. I wanted to be successful as a pastor. I wanted to be a successful pastor. So we want to be successful in business. We want to be successful in politics. The focus is on us. For Christ, however, the object of his leadership was not him. It was the people who followed him. Hear what he said in John chapter 14, verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me, the works that I do or the works I have been doing, they will be able to do also. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. Look closely at that verse of Scripture. Who is more successful there? Jesus says again, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater works than this. Remarkable. So for Christ, the object, you know, of his leadership, the purpose of, of his leadership, the focus of his leadership was not him. It was not his own success. It was the success of his followers. So for me, that was paradigm shifting. I took the attention of, of myself. I put the focus on the people. And for once, I was able to ask myself, what are their needs? What are their problems? What are their issues? So I feel that when many of us leaders, either in church or in business, wonder why our businesses or churches are not growing, sometimes we don't pinpoint what the real issue is. And I think it's self-centeredness. James chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss. You're praying the wrong prayer. He said, you ask that you may consume it upon your own pleasure. It's all about you. That's why your prayers are not being answered. That's what James chapter 4, verse 3 says. So, I believe that following you as a leader should hold the promise of life change for those who follow you. Matthew 4:19, Jesus said, follow me 
and I will make you something you've never been before. You caught fish, I'll give you influence over human beings. You know, the Bible is a coded book. It's a summary. Like John the Apostle said, uh, if they were to write everything that Jesus did, there's no book that could ever take such information. I try to imagine when Jesus approached uh, a man called Zebedee, uh, who was in the fishing boat with his two sons. And what we read in the Bible is that Jesus approached those two young men and said to them, follow me. And turned, and the Bible says, and they followed him. Do you think it was as simple as that? I'm just imagine you are in the fishing boat with your two sons, and your plan is that they inherit the business from you. Then a stranger walks up to you and then says to your two sons, follow me. And then your two sons take up after him. You don't know where they are going. Will you stay in the boat like that and be happy? <laughs> if I was Zebedee, I would follow him too. <laughs> uh, I would hold him and ask him to explain to me what is, <laughs> what is going to do with my two sons. I, I think Jesus said more than that. I think what Jesus did was to describe his mission. And I think he did such a good job of it that by the time he was done, the two young men and their father all agreed they would make better use of their lives following Jesus than staying in the fishing boat. That's why those two young men went after him. Follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you. I will, not I will teach you, I will transform you into people who have phenomenal influence over people's lives. So I say it again, following you should hold the promise of life change for those who follow you. I was leading in a culture where being a leader makes you superior to the people you are leading. That's the culture that I grew up in. And many of us in developing parts of the world have experienced that. Just simply occupying a leadership position makes you superior to the people you are leading. And in such a culture, leaders don't empower followers. And you know what? Christ also lived in such a culture. That's why he said to his disciples in Mark chapter 10, verse 42, Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over there. And their high officials exercise authority over them. That's what you have in such a culture. Now, when you, what that creates is hierarchical distance. The powerful are very powerful. And the powerless are very powerless. And such societies change very slowly if they change at all. When children are born into such a culture, they learn helplessness. They learn powerlessness. They have a feeling that they do not have the power to change anything. So power distance, which is what we call it, and hierarchical structures reflect the fact that power and responsibility are not shared equally in an organization. That's the reality anyway, anywhere in the world. Giat Hofstede conducted the Globe Research in 1980, and he considered how power distance and other factors affect leadership in different cultures. Now, some of the things that came up from the research showed that there's a downside to power distance. And the downside to power distance is that it can leave followers with low self-esteem and afraid to challenge a leader's views. When you have hierarchical distance, you have a situation where as a leader you're so powerful, the people around you have to kind of walk on eggshells. You know, they develop low self-esteem. And then they hardly 
will ever give negative feedback to their leaders. They say that they agree. They tend to agree with everything that the leader says, even when they know that it may not be right. Okay. Um, one other problem here. They tend to have to wait for approval before they do anything. They seldom exercise initiative. And then well, we call that a permission-seeking culture. There is also the tendency for leaders in such a scenario to be less accountable. And that can be a setup for moral failure and for scandals. What I observed that Jesus did was that he crushed the power gaps that he observed. Jesus crushed the power gaps between men and women, adults and children, leaders and their followers. So you have this power gap between men and women. And Jesus took that on directly. Like you observe the day they caught this woman in adultery and they said, <laughs> they brought her to Jesus. And the people who brought her, who brought her were the men. They said, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act the law of Moses says to stone her. What do you have to say? She was caught in the very act. Only her. <laughs> it's one of the most amazing stories of adultery I ever had. One woman. <laughs> caught, where was the guy? Yeah, it was a reflection of, of the society and the power gap. A man and a woman were not on the same okay, uh, level of influence. Uh, Jesus crushed the gap between adults and children because when you have a culture where you have that power gap, then the adults are very powerful. The children are powerless, helpless. They, they may be seen, but they are not to be heard. And even, in fact, that's if they are seen. In many instances, they shouldn't even be seen. When the adults sit down, you don't want the kids there. You run them somewhere else. So when Jesus was speaking to the crowd, children were clamoring to see Jesus. They also wanted to meet Jesus, to hear Jesus, to get close to Jesus. You remember the reaction of the disciples of Jesus? They shooed them away. Whose son is this? Take your boy. What are these kids looking for? This is serious business here. The Reverend Jesus is about to speak at the crusade. What are kids doing here? Take them away. You know what Jesus did? He stopped. Stopped his message right in the middle and said, bring those kids here. Bring those kids here. You don't know how valuable they are. In God's kingdom, there's something special about those kids. They don't have the problems that you adults have. In fact, you adults need to be like these kids if you want to function in God's kingdom. <laughs> Jesus observed the power gaps in church. The Pharisees had a different set of rules, you know, from the common citizens and the sinners. And Jesus would go on a Sabbath day into the synagogue. And he asked a man who had a withered hand, stand up. And Jesus looked around because he wanted to get the message clear. Which of you would have his animal fall into a ditch on a Sabbath day and not pick the animal up? Why is it a big deal for you for someone to be healed, a human being, on Sabbath day? Mister, stretch forth your hand. A number of the healings that he did, he did on Sabbath day, it was to confront the power structure in the society. He, he healed a lame man, told him, pick your bed, put it on your head publicly, and go to your house. He was defying the power structure of his day. I think that's what God's called us to do as leaders, that we should create new power structures, the Jesus kind 
of power structures where power is used appropriately. So, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, the Bible says that Jesus called his 12 disciples and he gave them authority. He gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sicknesses and diseases. He told his disciples that they could do what he did and even much more. That, I think, is one of the most amazing things I observed about the leadership of Jesus that he gave power away. I often wonder what I would do if I was Jesus and I was walking on water and Peter spoke from the boat, asking me to give him permission to walk on water. If I was Jesus, <laughs> walking on water, Peter now requests that he also wants to walk on water, I would ask him, Peter, when you were baptized, did the heavens open? <laughs> did you see a dove come down on your head? Did you hear a voice boom from heaven? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Peter, have you fasted 40 days and 40 nights? So you think walking on water is what ordinary people like you should do? If you love your life, stay in that boat, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> but the Jesus kind of leadership says, Peter, if I can do it, you can do it. Dude, take the power, walk on water. I think there is something about leaders and talented people that makes us think that others can't do what we do. Maybe because like Moses, they've not seen the burning bush. They didn't hear God's voice come from the bush. They've not been to the mountain, had God speak with lightning and thunder. So that's why we find it difficult to ask them to do the things we do. We are the ones God called. We are the ones who are anointed. So we don't want to delegate authority for them. I, I, I mean, that was, look, we're human. It happened to Moses, right? In Numbers 11, the people were crying out that they were tired of eating carbohydrates. <laughs> <laughs> they wanted some protein. So Moses prayed, Lord, am I the one who brought all these people out of Egypt? Now they're complaining, where am I going to get flesh for all these people to eat? He said, Lord, if it's true you really love me and I found favor on your side, just kill me. K kill me now. That's what happens to a leader when you are overwhelmed and we experience burnout. <laughs> so God said, you know what, I won't kill you. You're the one who's going to kill yourself. Uh, <laughs> get 70 of these elders, bring them out of the tabernacle. He said, I will take off the spirit that is on you and put it on them so they can prophesy with you. Moses did it. You know what? The Spirit of God came on the 70. All of them prophesied. Sorry, there were 68. There were two other guys who didn't come out. Wherever they were, the Spirit came on them. They were prophesying there. Joshua, the assistant of Moses, said, My Lord Moses, they didn't come out to the service. Why should they also receive the power? Moses said, Joshua, do you know what just happened? I never knew these people could do this. Lord, let everybody prophesy, not just these 70, everybody now. You know, sometimes pastors wonder why their churches don't grow. Leaders wonder why their businesses don't grow. I have an idea. I think it's because we have, as employees, church members, people who have phenomenal potentials, but something tells us they can't do what we do. And I have this important message for you, especially if you're a pastor. Shepherds don't give birth to sheep. They call pastors shepherds. We call church members sheep. Shepherds don't give birth to sheep. Only sheep give birth to sheep. In other words, there isn't much you're going to be able to do to grow a very large church personally. 
what shepherds do is to feed sheep. When the sheep go out to town and other sheep see them, they ask them, oh my, you're looking good. <laughs> what, what have you been eating? The sheep says, blah, come with me. <laughs> Let's go to Willow Creek. <laughs> If you live in an under-resourced part of the world like I have, you have a huge opportunity because the systems created by man are putting people down. That's our own opportunity. If you are in an under-resourced part of the world, see it as an unusual opportunity for empowering leadership. There is no point trying to lord it over people who are down already. Be innovative. Recognize their needs and their potentials. Empower them. Unleash their potentials for, for God's glory. I observed we had a lot of people in church who were poor. Rather than preach, give, 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 I realized they didn't have the money in the first place. So I said, is there anything I can teach them that can help them to get the money? I looked in the Bible. I saw entrepreneurial. I saw business. So I taught them. Abraham was a businessman not the priest in the synagogue. Isaac was a businessman. Jacob was a businessman. Even Christ was a businessman. Paul was a businessman. Start your business. Then they said, where, where do we get capital from? I said, capital? I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> I did some research. I came back. I said, how much money did God have when he was going to create the world? You just want to start a small business. God had to create the world. There was no money in Genesis. It's not the absence of money that makes you poor. What did God use? An idea, revelation. You need ideas, not money, to start your business. Okay? So I'm just simply saying that whatever challenges we have, wherever we are, we need to realize they are opportunities to empower people. Jesus did not only crush the power gap, he overturned it. You know what he said in Luke 22, 27? For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Rather than pray for a car, why don't you pray for grace to provide transportation for a whole city? Rather than pray for clothes, why don't you pray for opportunity to clothe a nation? Rather than pray for a home, why don't you pray for opportunity to provide homes for people in a whole nation? Once you begin to pray for people and to develop visions, not for you, but for cities and for nations, and then for a whole generation, I'm telling you, that's how to overturn the power gap and to get a grander vision. Thank you.